1. Amos chapter 1 verse 1 says this. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. I would tell you, as we come here to this uh, little book of Amos, Amos is called one of the minor prophets, not because his message is minor. If you've ever looked at any kind of breakdown of the books of the Old Testament, they'll have major prophets and minor prophets. And they're not called major and minor because somehow the major prophets had a more uh, inspired message by God or somehow that they were more important than the minor prophets. It's just that they're called major prophets because their books are longer. And they're called minor prophets because the books are shorter. All, everything from Genesis to, Revel Genesis to Revelation, God superintended to be in his word and inspired and is inspired by the Holy Spirit is profitable for us. So whether it be considered major or minor has nothing to do with the validity of the message that we would use those words major or, or minor. It's just in the length of the message. And as I just kind of referred to a little bit, I can't promise you if the message this morning will be major or minor on that, <laughs> on that kind of level of judgment, if it will be long or short, but we probably will split it between two different weeks. I'm calling this a short little mini-series here from Amos. It's only nine chapters long, by the way. You could go home and read it probably in 30 minutes, 45 at the max. You could go home and read it this afternoon. I encourage you to do that. It's only nine Nine chapters. It's a pretty short book in the Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily get a lot of airplay. There's one verse, a couple that get a lot of airplay, and we'll talk about those during the course of these messages. But for the most part, the book as a whole doesn't get a lot of airplay because it is, again, such a short book. But we're calling it Axioms from Amos. And I'm calling it Axioms. Axioms, you might be familiar with that word. It's a word that means truce. Now, I would have used truths from Amos, or I would have used the old-fashioned word that the old-timers used to use, verities. Verity also means truth. When Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say unto you, could be translated truly, truly, I say unto you. The old-timers used to call it verities. But truth and verity, neither one of those words start with an A like Amos. So we had to pick axioms from Amos to keep the alliteration going. Look at there, even alliteration starts with the... This will be a triple A message this morning. <laughs> Alliterations, actions from Amos. But I will tell you, this world uh, has a lot of things that they like to call truth. Although they won't call it necessarily the truth anymore. They don't even like to say a truth anymore. They've come up with a new phrase, my truth or your truth. Anybody heard those words before? That's something that is kind of, uh, I've grown to be, I like to say I'm only 29, but I'm quite a bit older than that. And perhaps... Because I am of an older age than that, those words still sound strange to my ears to hear somebody say, speak your truth or my truth. I don't think in those terms, and I, I think it's good not to think in those terms, because there is no such thing as my truth or your truth. There's the truth, and then there's untruth, which would also be known as a lie. There's, there's not as if there's something that's true for you and not true for me, so to speak. There is Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. There is God's word, which is truth. Jesus says in John 17, 17, in the high priestly prayer, he prays to his heavenly Father, sanctify them according to thy truth. Thy word is truth. How many know God's word is truth? He's not a man that he should lie. And again, perhaps it is the older I get, and I've mentioned it a lot here in recent memory, but... I am so thankful that in the midst of a world that's filled with lies, again, they can use whatever word they want to, misinformation, disinformation, whatever. In the midst of a world that's filled with lies, how many are thankful for the truth, the bedrock truth of God's word? Amen. The truth upon which we can stand. The truth upon which it is that the wise man would build his house not only hearing but also obeying. Aren't you thankful for the truth that is the word of God? Even when that truth would be hard, even when that truth would have rough edges to it, as Proverbs would say, better is the truth, even though it would be hard, spoken by, uh, even if it would, would hurt us, than would be kindnesses that are lies that would seem to come. How many know the truth is always where it's at? Now, Jesus said uh, that we should know the truth and the truth would set us 
free. Apart from truth, there is no freedom. There is only bondage. This world likes to talk again about my truth or your truth or inspirational truth, but they don't like the category so much of the truth. They don't like to admit that. I think of at school in the context that I work in on a Monday through Friday in the daytime basis, there will be certain principles, by principles I mean the people in administration, and they will come across the intercom, and there's one principal, assistant principal we have, that likes to, when they have opportunity to have the intercom and they're on it, they like to give the students certain inspirational words or inspirational quotes, and, and they want the students to believe in those and believe in themselves and what have you, and they give them these inspirational things, and not that the intention might not be good, but how many know if you're not a believer, believing in yourself is one of the worst pieces of advice you could ever hear. Why? Because the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can even know it? To believe in yourself. <laughs> believe in myself. What can I do? Uh, I don't even know all of my limitations, but I know a lot of my limitations. I need someone beyond me to believe in. Yeah. Believe in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And again, I'm not belittling these folks that maybe have good intention for kids and in the confines that they can speak to them in a public school. But how many know Truth is not just because it's inspirational. It's not just because it makes people feel good, but it's because it's found in the pages of Scripture. And Brother Todd, as he will do sometimes, he sent me a debate some time ago, and I had time to listen to it here recently. I'm turning it where that air goes off. I can see people freezing out there. If you start nodding off, I'll turn it back down. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, here it is, is that he sent me this, uh, this debate, and there's these two men that are arguing. By arguing, I don't mean with elevated voices toward one another. It's just one is making an argumentation, a, a case for believing in the Christian God from Scripture. And here is another gentleman that is uh, making a case for his self-professed atheism. And part of what the man that's making the case on behalf of atheism will say is he says that uh, the problem of evil... That there were people, especially in his family, that had died in concentration camps. And indeed, how many know, that's evil and that's wicked. Man's inhumanity to man certainly has, man's wickedness has lots of examples over the course of history. But that certainly has to be one of the worst, doesn't it? All these folks that would die in gas chambers, and he said that that led him to disbelieve in the existence of God. And to which the Christian uh, responded... Unless it is that you believe that there is a God who sits above us, who defines what right and wrong is, who are you to call what happened there wrong? Because someone else might call it right and what makes your decision better than him. Even if most people would agree with you. Most people have agreed about things that have been horrifically wrong throughout the course of history. What makes something right? What makes something wrong? What makes something good? What makes something bad is that there is a basis of truth. And that's found in the God of Scripture, not in the minds of any man, no matter how many degrees he may have or how many people that some popular figure may have behind them. How many know it's Scripture that defines what's good, bad, right, wrong, true, false. It's the bedrock of Scripture, is it not? So when we come to axioms or truths and this from the book of Amos, how many are thankful that you'll get little lines up there for me and you kind of see my, I've given away my first point already. But when you see the points that come up, they are points not that come from the mind of men. Oh, I may have phrased them a certain way, and others who study Amos may have phrased them different ways. But they come from Scripture, and how many are thankful for the truth of Scripture? Yeah. So we come here to Amos. Amos is, again, a minor prophet in the Old Testament. He prophesied during the same kind of time as Isaiah. Now, most are familiar with Isaiah, right? One of the major prophets, 66 chapters to his book and many passages well known. And look up there. You see, he said he prophesied in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. How many remember Isaiah's famous vision as recorded in his book says, in the day that king Uzziah died? Same one up there. So uh, uh, Amos and Isaiah are contemporaries. They're prophesying at the same time. Roughly around 750 B.C. Just to keep the numbers kind of simple, so to speak. And at that time, you had God's people. There were 12 tribes. There were 10 of them in a northern kingdom that was called Israel. 
And there were two of them in a southern kingdom called Judah. Now, Amos is from the southern kingdom. He's from the kingdom of Judah. He's part of the two tribes in the south. And he lives in this little town called Tekoa. And he's a sheep herder, a shepherd. Later on in this book, we'll also find that he's a fig picker. In other words, he would go out, he tended the sheep, and he picked the figs. That's what his life was about. That was his vocation. He was a sheep herder and a fig picker. And God calls him from being a sheep herder and a fig picker in the southern kingdom of Judah to be a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, to the ten tribes. And so here's this fig picker, fig picker and sheep herder from the southern kingdom, and he goes to the northern kingdom of Israel to prophesy. God calls him. And notice I put up here the first thing, first point from this uh, axiom from Amos coming from the first verse is God uses the common man. Now listen, I am not opposed to uh, Christian scholarship. If it's truly a devoted Christian that studies the Greek and studies the Hebrew and produces books and those who would be uh, very good students and, and they're good and gifted at putting together theological things, I am not against that. I've gleaned a lot of that myself. I've had a bit of that sort of education myself in that direction. But do understand this. It is not always the quote-unquote experts that are the right ones or the ones that are used by God. How many are thankful God has this? He can use anybody, somebody of fame and prominence. He can use them too if they use it in the right way. But how many know you look throughout the pages of Scripture and God seems to have a history of using the common man a whole lot, doesn't he? How many are thankful for that actually, right? And here it is, Amos, he's a, a sheep herder, a shepherd, and a fig picker. He's in good company. How many know Moses, though he grew up in the halls of Egypt, he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. And when God calls him, he's a shepherd. And he calls him back to bring God's people out of bondage. How many know David? David was a shepherd out in the field from a, 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 a small a, a family, so to speak, and he was considered the least likely amongst Jesse's sons to be king. He's a shepherd out in the field, but how many know God tends to use the common man, doesn't he? You go forward into the New Testament, you will find that when Jesus, he was born, and he was not born into the halls of great society. He was not born to the high priest family as considered of that day or into the uh, or into the home of a of someone that was a leader in Roman government or in the Jewish government so to speak even of the day. He was born to a very poor family that had to offer up for him the very common and poor offering you would for your child being born, that Jesus was born meek and lowly and lying in a manger, and that they came and found the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger just as they had been instructed. Jesus, though being fully God and fully man, was born of this world, the son of a carpenter. Was he not? Jesus, when he went out and he called people, yes, there was Matthew who was of some notoriety in the world, but by far the ones that he called in the New Testament were fishermen who were out and about, and Jesus said, I'll take you from being a fisherman to being a fisher of men. How many are thankful God can use the gift? You might even put it, should a wise man, or should I say, should God inspired in his word say it this way, you might even say that God causes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The things that are not to bring down the things that are. Because by this world and its greatness, the word of the cross is considered foolishness. But to those who believe through the foolishness of preaching and the foolishness of the message preached, God calls us to believe in the word of the cross that is everlasting life. How many are thankful for that this morning? Now listen, don't anybody hear that and me say that God, God can certainly use somebody of prominence. God can certainly use somebody of notoriety. God can certainly use somebody of skill. Certainly in our own lives. How many want to grow in the knowledge of God over the course of our life? So don't anybody hear me saying something that I am not. But I am telling you this. God doesn't need the next superstar to be saved. You know, God, Jesus is famous all by himself, and we need to proclaim who he is. How many are thankful God can use the common man? Amen. Sister Joe's podcast that she has, and if you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to listen to it. It's called 
America's got issues. You can find it. And how many know that's a group? Right? And so she has this podcast. And I've heard her describe many people, some in this room that she's had in there. And she will say it this way. She'll say, I, I mean, I, I won't say this eloquent or certainly as pretty as she does. But she says something. Here's an extraordinary, ordinary man. Or an extraordinary, ordinary individual. Why? Because what this world would consider ordinary, how many know, if used in the hands of God, it's extraordinary. Amen. I heard someone say it one time this way, and they, I don't have any props up here this morning, and not that I would have, but I, the man that I heard say it, he actually had a visual, and he said this. He said, now you'll see how many years ago this was. He had a basketball in his hand. He said, in my hand, this basketball ain't in it. He said, but you put it in the hands of Michael Jordan, and we got million-dollar franchises and championships, and that depends on who's handling the basketball, right? By the way, Michael Jordan is the best of all time. <laughs> I, that's uh, just my, my humble opinion, but I happen to be right. But at any rate, or, or, or you can say, here is this, uh, 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 you know, the golf ball, or, and then, but in the hands of Arnold Palmer or whatever. We could use a number. We could have a paintbrush and say in the hand of... Because, although I saw some of them Picasso things recently. Oh. They ain't all they crack. I can even tell. I, I mean, I don't. But they'd be worth a lot of money anyway, all right? But you have all these different illustrations, and some of you are probably getting a hold of what I'm talking about. But do understand this. You or I, we are nothing in and of ourselves. You say, give me a verse for that. Jesus said in John 15, apart from him, we can do Nothing, but I've got good news for you. If we are in the hands of our master, I will tell you, not that I don't appreciate Christian scholarship, truly devoted believers, but do understand this. Give me somebody that believes the word of God and that has read this book and will proclaim it as if it were true rather than trying to, oh, well, you don't really have to believe and you don't be, and this isn't important, and trying to make things to sound good to the world. Tell me the truth, and the truth comes from the pages of Scripture. How many are thankful God uses the common man? All right, thanks be to the Lord. Look here next, the next point. This is number two of 11. Number two, God punishes sin. Look, verse six. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. These who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble. And a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Now, when you look back at verse 6, it says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four. That phrase, if you do take my challenge, so to speak, and go home and read these nine chapters of Amos and count, Amos, through the inspiration of the Spirit, uses that phrase for three, even four transgressions. He uses that eight times altogether in these short, in these short chapters. He uses that phrase eight times. And it's a Jewish idiom. Then It's not saying there's just three or four sins. It's a way of God saying through this Jewish idiom, this uh, figure of speech of saying that their transgressions are indefinite. There's an indefinite number. I mean, a lot of them. But they're coming to an end. They're not coming to an end because the people are going to quit sinning and see the likeness. Said. They're coming to an end because God's going to punish those sins. How many know God punishes sin? Amen. He does. In fact, if you read, notice... We began in Amos 1.1, 1, 1, and now we're in the second chapter, a few verses in. If you read the intervening verses, there's this thing. For three transgressions, even four, and God, through the prophet Amos, addresses all these Gentile nations and all of their sins. And I will tell you, if you read scholars on the book of Amos, they say, kind of like a preacher preaching a message. When you're talking about somebody else's sins, you get a whole lot of buy-in. You get a whole lot of amen. And in other words, the, the way they put it is if Amos is preaching this message and he's preaching through chapter 1 and the opening verses of chapter 2, there'd be a lot of people in Israel, that northern kingdom, where he's preaching that, they would say, yeah, 
Yeah, these Gentiles, they're really bad. Yeah, yeah, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. But how many know God punishes sin? It's not just other sins. It's everybody's sins. And eventually, God will get to, in the message of the prophet Amos, to not just talking about the sins of the Gentile nations, but talking about the sins of Judah, the southern kingdom, and now the sins of Israel, the northern kingdom, to which Amos is called to preach. And notice the sins that are mentioned here. God says, for three transgressions and for four, I'll not revoke punishment. It says they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. What that is, is that is very intense greed. And what people would do is, even for the price of sandals, in other words, for not so much amount of money. I know we have inflation. Everything is a pretty fair amount of money anymore. But, but basically what the prophet's saying here is, even for things that wouldn't seemingly cost that much, what do, are people doing? They are taking people to debtor's prison because they owe such a small amount and they are basically selling people into slavery over such small amounts of insignificant things. And God didn't want that to happen for there to be such a greed that people would be sold into slavery for such small things. How many know greed is not confined to 750 B.C.? Greed goes through year after year after year after year. And I tell you, it's alive and well in 2024. Yeah. Now look here. The next thing says, look at the end of that. It says, they, a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. Sexual immorality, perversion. Where, and it's not just even, I mean, you see that a man and his son go to the same girl, and you can think about that being perverted in all kinds of ways. Incest maybe comes to mind, and that's one possibility here for this uh, one possible interpretation of this verse, which how many know that would be a horrible thing? Truly, it would be. But it's also possible that they're referring to cult worship where they would worship in these false religions. And so many, I will tell you, study the false religions over the course of the world, in the New Testament as well. And one of the ways that people would worship in false religion is to go into all kinds of perversions, all kinds of sexual immorality, to have relations with prostitutes, both male and female. And the reason why I mention that is because of this. They might not call it a religion in today's more enlightened world, but it's the same old stuff over and over and over again. All kinds of sexual immorality and perversion. They don't call it a religion, but there are demons involved, that I promise you. And how many know we have it rampant on the streets of our nation and around the world? And here it is, is that that's the second thing he's telling to Israel. This is to people that should know better. And he's saying, you're greedy, you're sexually perverted. Then it says here, on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. What did they do? That This goes back to the greedy sort of thing. Is if they'd gotten, like, let's say, Brother Kenny, he's got this beautiful blue shirt. Although I will tell you, purple was the color of the day. And those who were paying attention to wearing purple today, so if you're wearing purple, there's some extra. I don't have any scripture for that, but at, at any rate, let, let's say he's got this beautiful blue, let's say it was a jacket, and let's say we lived in a cold part of, of the country, and especially in a part of the world like what they had, where it might be warm during the day, but very cold at night. If he was to need something from me and give me his jacket as surety, in other words, you have this as collateral, so to speak, so that you know I'm going to... I couldn't keep that from him. At nighttime, I'm supposed to give it back to him so that he won't be cold at night. The law even mentioned that specifically back in the law of Moses. Well, what did people do? They were so greedy. I don't care if you're going to be cold at night. I'm going to keep Even if I don't be, I'm going to keep it. I don't care that you're cold. I mean, that's going back to the, the, the greedy. And then what did they do? But they went to false temples, the house of their God. They drank the wine of those who had been fine. So there was drunkenness that was involved too. Now, I tell you, greed, sexual immorality, drunkenness. That was 750 B.C. How many know some things, so why does it never change? How many know we still got a lot of that? You can call it by all different other kinds of names, but we have that today, do we not? We have greed with all kinds of manifestation of corruption and of wickedness 
one man to another and against the laws of God. We have all kinds of sexual immorality where it is that people would have and justify all kinds of different intimate uh, relationships uh, that uh, and having, um, you know, a land ring and what have you. People will justify it in all sorts of ways, but it's wrong. Yeah. All right, only between a, a married man and woman is that sanctioned by God. And then it is that, and then drunkenness, that they would not, that they would be drunk and be even with their neighbor's coat there in the house of their God. And then the house of their God doesn't necessarily even mean in the, and we'll talk about this more next week in Bethel. It wasn't where the, the temple of Yahweh was, but that they are serving false gods. So there's idolatry, there's greed, there's sexual immorality, and there's drunkenness. And what does Amos say? God punishes sin. And he's telling them it's going to happen. And I'll give a little bit away here. We'll talk more about it as we go through these other points. But I will tell you, at the time that Amos addresses them in the north, everything's going pretty good for them in the north. Their borders have expanded. Jeroboam II is the... the notice Amos 1.1 will say it's Jeroboam. And that is his name, but he's Jeroboam II. There have been a king named Jeroboam that started the northern kingdom. We'll get more into that a little later on. But things are going pretty good. Can you imagine? It's one thing to go to people when they're down and out and they don't have any kind of funds and they're being, they have uh, stuff coming against them from every side and tell them they've sinned. And repent. It's another to come to people that everything seems fine with them. They're doing fine financially. Their borders have expanded. Everything seems to be going good for them. And you tell them they're sinning, their retorts, they reply back to you as well. Look at me. I'm doing okay. How many know? There God punishes sin. If, 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 and and there's, a, there's a payday coming Sunday just because Friday ain't hit yet. Don't mean it ain't coming. That's right. right? So God punishes sin. Next thing here. Amos 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And notice the a point made up there. God speaks to and through his people. And he does. He speaks to his people and he speaks through his people. I was telling you, my internet came back up this week. It came back up on Wednesday. It was down for a week. It was, it came up. I would tell you, when it went out, I won't tell you all the story here because I don't want to get in the flesh. <laughs> no, I, I won't tell you all the story here, but what happened was, is I let them know that they, they let me know, actually, by my cell phone. They said, there's an outage in your area of your Internet. I expected that after the storm. Something could happen. How many know things happen after the storm? I expected that. They said, would you like us to text you when it gets back on? I said, yes. They texted me the next day. And then two days after that. And then the next day after that. They texted me to let me know it was working. And guess what? It weren't working. And they would say, is all your equipment working? I'd say, no. They'd say, well, can an agent call you at this number? I was thrilled. Someone was going to talk to me whose initials weren't AI. <laughs> all right? And, uh, and so I was thrilled. Well, about two minutes, I said, yes, of course you can call me at this number. Because each other time I tried to call, they would they basically go through this spiel, the machine, the AI, artificial Intelligence, I'm sure that's who's handling it. They would go through this spiel of telling me, it ain't working and any agent can't tell you any more than I can. And they would actually say, goodbye. Then there was no option. And, I mean, there used to be an option. You could hit zero and maybe get somebody. <laughs> next. No more. They wised up to that. And so then after they told me an agent would be calling me, they send me a text saying, there ain't no agent to call you, but can you call an agent? I'd be happy to call an agent. I call the number they give me. Guess what it tells me? You can't talk to an agent. <laughs> My mouth is like this is frozen. I expected there to be some kind of process to get it back up and going. But how many know the only thing worse than not having it up and going is them thinking that it's up and going and they ain't even coming to you. Right? You want them to know this is not working. Not Keep me on your list. Keep me on your It took a long time before I could speak to anybody. Finally, several days later, I got to speak to somebody, but it was 
quite the process trying to speak to them. Can I tell you, we had that, I love that song. I will tell you that song, Lord Feed Your Children. That was a new song for us. And uh, I don't mind, it. I changed the verses. I rewrote the verses, but I kept the chorus the same. But I like it where it is that we pray to God, and we should on a regular basis, whether it be at a church service or whether it be when you individually sit down to study scripture, pray, God, I know you have spoken to me through your word. Please take, let the encumbrances, let the things that would easily beset me, let the things that would distract me, let the things that would keep me from understanding be away from me. And your Holy Spirit, who you have given to help me to understand your word, may, may I be filled with your spirit and walk in the enlightenment of your word. How many want that to be? Because God has spoken to us. Yeah. And not through artificial intelligence, but through the ultimate intelligence that is through His Holy Spirit. He has spoken to His people. Some people say, God never speaks to me. When did you read your Bible last? God has spoken to us in His Scripture. How many are thankful? Amen. Now that doesn't preclude, in other words, that doesn't mean that God won't speak. And everyone that's followed God for any period of time can say there were times when maybe you thought you were going to speak to one person about something of the Lord, but yet you felt directed. Whatever words, people put different words upon it. But then you suddenly felt to go a different way. Or you felt led to do this thing instead of that thing. You're not sure why. But God used it in some way. I'm not saying those things can't happen. But if you're waiting for lightning for God to speak to you, or you're waiting for some voice, I, I will tell you, I used to, I went to a Christian university, and we were on the second floor. And it was about the time, remember those karaoke machines? Maybe they still have them, I don't know. The real karaoke machine, and they had a cassette player. And I had a roommate, he would, we, we were on the second floor, he'd open up the window, and he got it, he had a karaoke machine, and he'd put it out there. And he'd turn that thing where, you know, you could do different effects on those karaoke machines. And he'd get that microphone up like this, and he'd wait for somebody, he could see him down there, and they couldn't see him. He'd look down there, and they'd come from, he said, this is God speaking. <laughs> and he would, he would kind of, rattle their cage a little bit, they look up and then eventually, you know, they got caught on that if you passed below that my roommate, my, it wasn't ever me, just so you know, I wasn't up to none of them shenanigans. <laughs> Don't believe them, but his name was Will. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that was his name. Uh, I still remember his last name too, but I won't give you that because you might search it in Google. But at any rate, he would, he would pull these little, some people are waiting for God's voice like that. It's in the pages of scripture. Read your Bible. You say, well, I can't understand it all. I understand you might not be. I don't understand it all either. I've been studying a long time. There's people in here that have studied longer than me. Is there anybody who can raise your hand and say, I understand every single line. I understand every single syllable. I anybody can say that? Keep studying that, right? We keep studying God's Word, and we lean upon the Spirit to enlighten us. And, and, and we study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not be ashamed, literally blush and embarrassment, but those who would rightly divide the word of truth, God's holy, living, active, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword word. We want to be those kind of people, but God has spoken. How many thankful well, God speaks to his people? Amen. And how humbling that he would speak through his people. You may say, can God speak to me? It says prophets there. I don't consider myself a prophet, someone might say. Well, listen, I'm not talking about a prophet in the sense that you might think. I'm talking, how many, any time that we speak the word of God, we are in one biblical definition of the sense prophesying in the sense that we're telling the truth. When we say, repent and trust in Christ for salvation. When we say you must be born again. When we say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, anyone that comes to the Father must come through Him. How many we're telling the truth? Amen. God speaks to His people, and God speaks through His people. Isn't that a humbling thing? Amen. I will tell you, you know, we are uh, reading something a brother wrote that some weeks ago in a show. I said, look here. He says, ambassador for Christ. I love that because that's scriptural. We are ambassadors for Christ. We don't get to make up the stuff, but we're called to deliver the stuff. God speaks to his people. God speaks through his people. And what Amos is talking about here, God doesn't do anything unless he reveals his counsel to his servants and prophets. Amos is saying here, 
There's judgment that's going to come to Israel, and God was speaking to him and through him to tell the people about it. How many have ever read through the Old Testament, and just be honest, and you see all this, especially maybe, maybe you've read through it a lot now, and you understand a lot more, but anybody remember reading through it, especially in the early days of your Christian walk, you're like, wow, that seems pretty harsh. Anybody? I mean, in all honesty, you look pretty. Fire and brimstone comes from heaven. I mean, the earth swallows them up. The clay, I mean, the, the quail. I mean, there's just all kind of things swallowed up in the sea. Anybody ever read through that and saw, wow, I just, you know, Lord, I, I know that, that your character, you are perfectly righteous. But see, can I tell you, God would send his word to folks to warn them. So many times, as I like to put it, there were shots across the bow before there was fire on the bridge. God would send his word. I don't mean, know, he's not obligated to do that, but he would send those to warn about the coming judgment. And I will tell you, and again, I am not a political preacher by any stretch of the imagination, but anybody that thinks that God is not going to punish and in some ways has already begun to punish for the perversion and for the murder of, of the unborn and for all these various sins that are going on. Anybody that thinks that he's okay with that and there's not punishment to come, you're living in a dream world. And here it is, God's spirit. They may turn away, like they would turn away from Amos, like they turned away from nearly every true prophet they would turn away from. But that does cause people to turn away from it. Don't keep it from being the truth. And when they stand before God, they will hear. I say they'll hear. They will not be able to give an excuse to say, I don't know if they'll literally have mental images of that crazy preacher telling them to turn and put trust in Christ. I don't know if they literally will have that image in their mind, but I do know this. Nobody will stand before God and be able to give an excuse to say, I didn't know. Nobody will be able to stand before him and give an excuse. God speaks to and through his people. I mean, you know that's a wonderful privilege. But also an awesome responsibility. Now look here next. God wax to win. Now, that one I had to get the alliteration, wax to win. But it'll, some, some will catch on right away. But uh, by, the end, by the time we're through with this point, I hope you'll see what I mean there. Amos chapter 4, verse 6 to 12. God says this to Amos. I being God here. But I, God, gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities. And lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not. Pay attention to this phrase. Yet you have not returned to me. Declares the Lord. Declares Yahweh. Cleanness of teeth there means you didn't have any food to eat. It doesn't mean you got the teeth whitening or things. It means you didn't have any food to eat. Your teeth were clean. Why did you didn't have any food to eat? And notice lack of bread makes that clear. But even though they had famine. They did not return to God. Look at verse 7. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would be dried up. So there's drought there. So two or three cities would scatter to, stagger to another city to drink water but would not be satisfied. Look at this phrase. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. And it's what's this phrase? Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. And here's this phrase again. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand snatched from a, a blaze. And here's this phrase again. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Now look at verse 12. Therefore, thus will I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Look at this. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Now, if you read through those verses, and again, you might have forgotten all the different things, but there was plague, there was famine, there was drought, there was being defeated by enemy armies. And how many have read through the Old Testament and saw that happen to God's people over and over again, right? And what God is saying in these passages and Amos is, all of these things, drought came to you, plague came to you, defeat came to you, famine came to you. And yet, each time, notice the phrase that's repeated there. You did not return to me, 
You did not return to me. You did not return to me. I would tell that's okay, sister. I think that's like the second time I've ever heard, ever heard little Kevin ever ever say his name. That means it's a good, it's got to be a good message. If, he, if, 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 if little Kevin's amen, because I've never heard him say anything. <laughs> I said it's a good message, amen. But here it is. Each time he said, "Yet you have not returned to me." God whacked them, so to speak. And I use that word because of the alliteration. God poured out judgment upon them. But is it just because God's a meanie? And he says, ha, 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 ha. Boom. You know, is it just because he's looking for every little thing they do and he's going to whack them all? Is it because he changed the old hymn around? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, he will squash you like a bug instead of looking down in love. Right? Is it because of that? Is it because God's an ogre? No. He whacked them. He disciplined them. Now, how many know he warned them in advance? He warned them and he whacked them, all right? He would warn them, but then when they wouldn't repent, he would whack them. But what was the purpose for the warning? What was the purpose for the whacking? So that he could win them. In other words, them to return unto him. I was listening to a a Christian podcast the other day, and someone called in, and they or they sent an email or something. It was where this Christian podcaster would uh, would answer questions. He does that once a week. Various things come in, and this one Christian parent had a a, a question about spanking a child, and said, uh, you know, even in my Christian circle, spanking's kind of gone out of favor. And I was wondering, should I spank my child? Should I do that? Should I spank my child? And the Christian podcaster said, spanking is biblical. And how many know it is? Amen. Right? You read, now, listen, I'm not for the abuse of any child, but not disciplining. Not disciplining a child is also child abuse. Right. All right? You want them to know not to touch hot stove. You want them to know not to walk out in the middle of the street. You want them to know to honor God. You want them to know that sin, what it is, its consequences, and what it would be. Right? And you want to teach them that as much as you can when they're kind of under your, I hate to say control, because... Not that we ever have as much control as we ever think. <laughs> if, you, if you want to find out how little control you have over children, come see me for a day. <laughs> Walk in my moccasins. All right? Walk in my shoes or whatever they say. Walk in my sketchers. All right? And you'll see. All right? But, but uh, we want to do that as much while they're under our control before they get out where we can't protect and shield them as much as what we have opportunity when they're young. But Proverbs will say this. Proverbs will say... That you spare the rod, you spoil the child. In other words, you use the rod, why? Not to get out your anger and your frustration, but so you don't spoil the child. Scripture will say that when you use a rod, and even when you use strong language, you use the rod, and, and you, you use it to discipline your child, but that what you're doing is you're saving their soul from hell. All right? Scripture will say these. You go to the New Testament, Matthew 18, talking about Church discipline. You catch your brother caught in a sin. You go to confront him about a sin. And that could be an uncomfortable conversation. If he doesn't repent, you take others with you. If still they don't repent, you bring them before the church. That's an uncomfortable process. That's uncomfortable things to our uh, modern sensibilities, I guess. But why is the purpose of it? Each time, one of the purposes is this. It says to get your brother to repent so that you have won your brother. The idea is to do it with the goal in mind of winning. Getting them to come into the way of the Lord. God says here, I whacked you with the drought. I whacked you with the famine. I whacked you with the plague. I whacked you with the feet from every eye. And still you would not return. What was God's object? To return to me. But still the people would not because they are stubborn. They have, they have hardened their hearts and so turned away from God. They have given themselves over. To these sensualities. In fact, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God whacks to win. Look here next. Only two more points for today. This one will be a short one. Amos chapter 5, verses 8 to 9. He who made the, and I hope I'm saying this right, he who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness in the morning, who also darkens day into night who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. 
the Lord, that is Yahweh, is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong, so that destruction comes upon the fortress. Now, I only gave you a taste here of these two verses, but if you read all the context here, God points out the Pleiades and the Orion. That's constellations. He's saying the true and living God, Yahweh, he made the stars. He made the constellations. I saw where a Christian minister posted this. Uh, they got a, a picture from, from space. One of those two folks, you, you heard about the two astronauts up in space that are stuck there for a long period of time? Only supposed to be there a few days and will be there several months. Anybody heard of that? And one of those is a fella, and I can't remember his name. He's a very, very devout Christian. And he believes in six-day creation, and he believes in the unearth, and, and yet he's astronaut at the time. Anybody that says only stupid people believe that, there's one of them up in the up right now. And there's, you know, the, the number's very small of people that have been up there and there right now, and, and he don't believe that. So, there. <laughs> but he, he got, the, there was this picture of, you could see in space the dividing line between light and darkness on the face of the globe. And they took a picture showing, here's the light and here's the dark. And you could just see it on the globe, light and dark. And, and this Christian minister that posted it said, what an amazing God we have. God made the stars. And if you look here in this passage, one of the other sins that God is confronting them for is that they serve the false gods of the stars. They worship the stars rather than worshiping the one who made the stars. And the reason I put up there, God hates horoscopes, is because of this. Anybody that reads the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, says, oh, that was back then, and we, we don't have those things. That, again, just like a mission, we have greed today. We have sexual perversion today. We have idolatry today. We have... Uh, drunkenness and substance abuse today. We have those who worship the stars today. What? You go through the thing at the grocery store. The worshiping the stars right there. Just pick up the horoscope or get it online or whatever. I can't tell you how many. I don't even. I have so little. This phone, especially this new one, that phone right. If you call me right now and leave a message, it'll say at the end of it. Don't be it's time. It's, I can't speak Spanish, but I don't know how to get it off of there. It's, it's some lady's voice speaking Spanish to you. If you call me right now, that's not, and I don't know how to fix it. My wife will tell you. Brother Mike and Stephanie that are here on Wednesday nights, he called me the other day. He left me a message, and it was in Spanish. He said, I said, yeah, I know you got some lady's voice. I said, I promise you that's not me. And, I, and uh, so if you call me right now and it's a lady's voice in Spanish, that's probably me. So I'll figure out how. But I will put up my phone, and I'll pull it up, and it'll say, somehow it knows. The, I don't know how it knows the month. But how many ever... Open up your cell phone. You're like, I don't know how it knows this stuff. But it knows, I'm sure, probably some information somewhere that I'm not cautious enough to know not to put out there. But it knows what month I was born, and it'll tell me my what the, the astrological sign or whatever, and it wants to give. Click here for your update for the day. I said, no, thank you. I'll open up Scripture. Thank you very much. Amen. God hates horoscopes. You don't have to look to the stars. Look to the one who made the stars. God didn't like it then, and he ain't changed his mind about it now. It's not, it's, and, and again, I don't know that there's anybody in here involved in that, but I will tell you, if, if we don't talk about it, then people don't know it. You don't know to tell your kids, and it's right here. God hates horoscopes. He hates these things because it's worshiping. It's idolatry. It is absolutely, I don't know, I don't remember Miss Gail and, 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 and Bill here for a number of years. Miss Gail went on to be with the Lord some Bill's now in his 90s. He lives in a, in a home in Lehigh, um, and, uh, and he's doing pretty good. Bill, uh, Gail, she went home to be with the Lord in her late 80s. We had a memorial service here. Any of you remember that? But Gail, she told me, she says, Pastor Ben, one time I was up here and I was preaching, I mentioned something about the Ouija board or something like that in the course of time. How God hates that too, right? Because that's spiritual in nature. You don't, don't play with fire. And she told me afterwards, she said, Pastor Ben, she says, I was only about 20 years old. She says, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a believer. I didn't know. She said, I saw people messing around with these tarot cards. And I thought, I could do that for fun. She said, because I'm kind of a, you know, outgoing. And she was. She was a very outgoing person, very smart lady. And she said, I could do that. And she said, I, she said and I didn't have the biblical background to know nothing about it. She said, but about 10 or 15 minutes into that and me entertaining my friends with this, I could feel something that now she recognizes demonic. And she said, I knew I didn't want to have nothing to do with that anymore. She was thankful that even though she wasn't a 
dedicated believer at the time and didn't really have the, the knowledge to know what was up with that, she was glad that I brought it up during service because she says, I knew then, even not as a dedicated believer, I knew there was a problem with that. God hates horoscopes. The last point this morning. Amos 5, 18 to 20. God gets his man and he gets it right. Look at verse 18. Get this word picture. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion. You get away from the lion, but what happens? And a bear meets him. Or he goes home. He gets away from the lion. He gets away from the bear. But then he goes home. He leads his hand against the wall and a snake bites him. Look at verse 20. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom, with no brightness in it? For those, and, and I'll get more into this next week. But in the northern kingdom of Israel, everything was going fine for them economically, politically. They were in a pretty good place as far as the world will go. Their GDP, if they were on the list that we have of countries and how they were doing, they'd have been pretty high up on the list at this particular time. But how many know high up on the list of the world doesn't mean high up on the list of God? And so they were doing pretty well. Amos was going to come and confront them. And if you would ask them, oh yeah, I serve the Lord, I serve God. How many people do those who preach out on the street meet that say they're Christians, they're Christians, engage in all kind of immorality, idolatry, all them things we talked about. Yep, I'm a Christian. Are you in church on something? Oh, no, 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 I went one that day. You know, right? You read your Bible? Oh, Bible, I got, I got one somewhere. I don't know. Right? And we'll talk more about that next week. But these people would say they long for the day of the Lord, but I, or the day of the Lord was fine for them. But how many know for those not in Christ, the day of the Lord is a day of reckoning? Mm -hmm. And he says, basically, for those not in Christ, here's what it's going to be. You thought you escaped the lion. Whew. You escaped the bear. Whew. But then the snake gets you. Something's going to get you. <laughs> All right? Get the word picture. You get away from the lion, <clears throat> then the bear gets you. You get away from the bear, the snake gets you. God always gets his man. Right? You ever heard that said about the Westerns long ago? Some sheriff always gets their man, right? Right? The long arm of the law. You go through, most in here are old enough to remember. Remember when they were looking for Sodom Hussein and then they found him in one of these holes in the ground they found him. They subsequently would try him and convict him and he would be executed. But they were looking for him. Remember, they were looking for him for some time and they called him. Remember Osama bin Laden? They were looking for him. They looked all over. Finally, they found him. And such a coward was he. He tried to put his wives in front of him when they, they when they when when he tried to when they were taking him out. But they found him. They got his man. Those who were studying here recently, just in the past few days, the guy that orchestrated the October seventh attacks on Israel a little over a year ago. Such awful attacks, where they sent people in. Did this terrorist group? They sent people in to murder men, to rape and murder women and children. And I mean, it is, I have he heard online, there are places where you can click and they will show you some of the, I can't, I cannot, I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done because then you realize the awfulness rather than just hear about it. But I just, I don't know that I have the stomach for it. Hearing about it is hard enough, at least from, from my, from, from what I think I can take. But I will tell you, it's an awful thing. And this guy orchestrated this. And for over a year, he seemingly, he's still alive. He's still alive. He's still alive. They found him. Some of you can see it if you've watched it online. This drone came in, and this drone found him. And he's trying to swat away the drone. And before you know it, he has gone on to his great reward. And it ain't going to be pretty. Amen. But here it is. How many have heard of it? His name was Sinwar. If I'm pronouncing it right. They found they got. If, can I tell you? In all of the terrorist activity. And countries wanting to track down these people. And rightly so. In all of the crimes that have ever been done. You've seen it on TV. To a lesser degree. Even a theft and whatever. And they'll show videos. Some of these people are called. They put up wanted posters. On the. Uh, you know. on the At, at the county. Uh, you know. House in the city. Uh, headquarters, they'll put these up and at the post offices. Some of them they catch. Many of them maybe they catch. But do they catch them all? But I'm here to tell you, those who don't repent and put trust in Christ, 
They may think they got away from the bear, but there's a bear coming. A lion, but there's a bear coming. They may think they got away from the bear, but they make it home, and there's a snake there. The judgment of God cannot be avoided. It's appointed that the man wants to die, and then the judgment. God always gets his man, and he always gets it right. There have been cases, some of you remember, I remember a famous case years ago when they had the Olympics in Atlanta, and there were these pipe bombs that were found in this, his name was Richard Jewell, I remember, right? And he was a security officer, and he found these pipe bombs, and he reported it. He initially was regarded as a hero for finding these pipe bombs before they had a chance to kill people. But then he came under suspicion that somehow maybe he planted them there. And he, he was never brought up on charges, and it came to light. He had not done that. It had been just as he found them. He didn't plant them. It came out that he was not guilty of the crime, but they tried him in public opinion, and he was guilty. How many know there have been those our criminal justice system? Perhaps even with good motives. They thought they had the right information, but they didn't get Can I tell you, God's judgment cannot be avoided. He always gets his man, and he always gets it right. Nobody will stand before God and say, but I got evidence. I wasn't guilty. No. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. God always gets his man and woman, and he always gets it right. Amen. But I got good news for you. If you're in Christ, your sin, as I mentioned this past Wednesday night in, in a message from John chapter 8 called Caught, where the woman was caught in the act of adultery. They thought they caught Jesus. Of course, you could never catch Jesus in a sin. But one day, can I tell you, one day, one day on a hill called Calvary, the sins of all those who would put trust in Christ, in a sense, caught up to Jesus. Not because he somehow was running from them, but because the proper time had come about. And he bore the penalty and punishment, not for his sin, but for your sin, for my sin, upon the cross. And what is it that some will say? In fact, there's some people you'll tell the gospel to, and they'll say, it doesn't sound right to me. It, if there is a right and wrong, if there is a God, if there is punishment for sin, if there really is a hell, then it doesn't sound right or fair to me that someone could bear my penalty rather than me having to pay my penalty. How many have ever heard that sort of thing come from somebody? Well, Aren't you glad that you don't get to pick what truth is? God tells us the truth. And what does the truth say in Romans chapter 1? Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to all who believe. To the Jew first and then unto the Greek. And then what does he say? For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It is right that those who will put faith in Christ, he would bear their sin upon the cross. And though it might not seem fair from a human illustration or explanation, aren't you thankful in the eyes of God? He looks and when he sees the children of God, he no longer sees our sin. But he sees us blood bought by the power of the one who died on the cross for our sin. Oh, that's good news. You don't want to be apart from Christ. God will get you and he will get it right and it will not be pretty. But if you put your trust in Christ, Jesus, so to speak, and I don't say this in any kind of, um, I don't know, way to make it more grandiose, but in a very real sense, if you're trusting Christ, your sin called up to Jesus and he bore it for you willingly that we might be forgiven and free. And that's good news. God gets it right. And when he says it's right, if you trust in Christ and your sins are forgiven, that's good news. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come before you today. If there be any here that know not Christ, any that not have, that have not repented of sin and put trust in him alone for salvation, I pray by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word, that they will be convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And that they will put trust in Christ, the only one who could, and the one who did, bear the penalty for sin upon the cross. That we might be forgiven, that we might be free. And that we might be filled with your spirit and to walk in the newness of life. If there's any here today that that's not a reality for, I pray they will be convicted 
and come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. Lord, for those who are your children, I pray you would rejoice in the truth of Scripture and that we would know that Scripture teaches us the truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's not a man that he would lie. And the truths we've talked about this morning, just a few from this tiny book, but yet powerful book in the Old Testament. We thank you that you use the common man, Lord. We thank you that you use instruments that the world would take no account of, and yet you use them to the glory of the Almighty God and for the purposes of the kingdom of God. We thank you, dear God, that indeed that you... While you punish sin, and we have that message to proclaim, and there's sin that people don't realize today or they don't think of as sin because culture has told them things that indeed is disinformation, misinformation. We call it lies because that's what it is. But greed and sexual perversion and idolatry, immorality, drunkenness, Lord, these things are sins and you will punish those sins. We thank you, dear God, though, that you indeed have made the way through Christ Jesus that forgiveness for those sins would be made available through his precious blood for those who repent and put trust in him. Lord, we thank you that you speak to and through your people. We pray, dear God, we, that we would be in the pages of your word to know what you have said and that we would take the awesome privilege and responsibility Lord, by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word to proclaim this message to a lost and dying world. Lord, before we leave this place this morning, we remember some prayer requests amongst our uh, congregation, those dear to us this morning. We lift up Miss Betty to you, pray for your healing hand to be upon her, for your hand to be upon her spirit, soul, mind, and body. We bless our dear sister, encourage her too, we pray. Lord, we pray for Sister Kay. We pray that as she has this appointment tomorrow, that things would go well and she'd be able to get relief from this pain she's been having, Lord, and touch our dear Sister Kay. Lord, we lift up to you Michael Kniep's aunt, Nancy, that he sent request in for this morning. Lord, we pray for your healing touch, your healing hand to be extended to her, dear God, and that she would most of all come to know Christ. Lord, we lift up a man by the name of Dink, a prayer request that came in. Lord, just to pray for him this week, no specifics given. But we pray, dear God, that your hand would be upon him spiritually, most importantly, if you know not Christ, that he be drawn to salvation, that you would bless him and his body and in every air. We pray you would touch this man. Lord, we pray for Thomas, a young man that's going through uh, major surgery. And we pray for your hand to be upon him and upon this process. Lord, we lift up to you, Sister Regina, not feeling the best this morning. We pray your healing hand extended to our dear sister. We pray for the jail ministry, dear God, this afternoon, and pray that as your gospel goes forth, you would draw people to the freedom that's found only in Christ. Pray for an upcoming MRI and pray that uh, things go well, dear God, Lord. We lift up, Lord, unsaved loved ones. For your throne this morning, Lord, moms and dads and sons and daughters and nieces and nephews and those who would live close to us and those far away, we pray your hands would be upon them and draw them unto Christ. Lord, we pray, dear God, for the, uh, I remember right it's this week that that uh, pro-life meeting was moved to, and we pray your hand to be upon that meeting and upon those gathered together. And we pray, dear God, for, Lord, conviction to come upon individuals and collective of society with regard to, Lord, this issue of abortion and life. We pray that you would draw hearts and minds, most of all, into the life that's found in Christ and in him alone, eternal life. We give you thanks and we give you praise. You are worthy of it all. Be with every request that's unmentioned this morning, known only to hearts and minds. Lord, we lift up uh, Mrs. Sims to you. Lord, dealing with this cancer, we pray your healing touch to be upon her. 
Lord, we lift up to you, Alan, and pray your healing touch upon him. Lord, we, we just, we thank you, Lord, that you care about the needs of your people and the things that will be upon our hearts and minds. We give you thanks and praise this day. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and in the power of the Spirit that we come. And all of God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope and of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of His power extended to all who believe. Amen and Amen. And before you're dismissed this morning, again, if there's anyone that would like to be baptized,